Next, I'm going to bring on Ishmael Houston Jones. He's a figure revered for his perspicacity and his work in several cultural fields simultaneously. We came to know him through his theatrical work with Dennis uh, Cooper, including them, knife, tape, rope, and the undead performance vehicles that took off from text and music and moved bodies through them like tokens across the wires of an abacus possessed by AIDS and the disaster of Reagan. But in his writing, one felt what one was coming close to the man's essence. Houston Jones is a choreographer, author, performer, teacher, curator, and arts advocate known for his improvisational dance and language work. Houston Jones and Fred Holland shared a 1984 New York Dance and Performance Bessie Award for their work, Cowboys, Dreams, and Ladders. And he shared another Bessie Award in 2011 with Dennis Cooper and, I'm sorry, 2001 with Cooper and Chris Cochran for their 2010 revival of their 1985 collaboration, Them. This story, The End of Everything, that we publish in our book, appeared in Farm Boys, issue number five of Farm, the house magazine of the Chicago New York City Gallery feature, and its bemused owner, the singular and beloved Hudson. I'm sorry that Hudson couldn't be here today. We sure couldn't have made this book without him. The guest editor of Farm Boys was Farmer Joe Jr. But we all knew it was Dennis Cooper. Farmer Joe Jr. gathered together a wild bunch of provocateurs, among them Manuel Ramos Otero, Benjamin Weissman, David Sedaris, Richard House, Gary Indiana, Bob Gluck, Brad Gooch, Sam D'Alessandro, Richard Hawkins, Ken Simon, Bernard Waltz, and others, but the end of everything caught our attention right away. Interviewing Ishmael Houston Jones recently, we asked him about some of the, its remarkable elements the story works with. Oh, it's such a, like a long interview, I think I'll skip to the chase. Because we have the real thing here, and can ask him anything. And uh, I don't know what you're gonna be reading tonight, Ishmael, but, but I'm so glad you're in our book and that you're here tonight. It's been too long. I have horrible mic technique, so if you can't hear me, tell me. I feel like a real fraud being listed with these people because I don't self-identify as a writer. Um, I'm a choreographer, basically, among other things. Uh, this piece I'm going to read is from the book, uh, The End of Everything. It was uh, written in the mid-80s when I was dealing with several different things. Um, in, here in New York, the AIDS crisis was sort of at its peak, and many friends and colleagues and lovers were dying or sick or getting well. And at the same time, my, my political sort of activism sent me to Nicaragua in the middle of the war, and I wound up teaching Sandinista soldiers dance improvisation. Like, <laughs> it was kind of stupid. Um, sometimes they would arrive in their fatigues and change into their leotards, and I would teach them their rifles against the wall. Um, so this is sort of a fantasia about those two elements. There's music to distract you. The airport had been closed for almost two weeks. There was a ban on exit visas. Matt sleeps and dreams. The end of everything. One. He wakes up, a wrestler defeated by his own sweaty sheet. Two. He wakes up reassured by the sounds of lizards on his screens and parrots in the trees. Three, he wakes up, takes a piss in a green plastic bucket, takes a short look at two unhealing sores, spits out some red foamy toothpaste, 
rinses his mouth with rum, takes a painful, watery, rotten, eggy shit, checks for blood, sprinkles some pine oil into the bucket. Four, Matt heads to the cafe. He never liked this cafe. It's in the bougie quarter across from the Paris Hotel, Palace Hotel. It's the only one that's still open. Five. He steps over a few new bodies. Six. The heat is bearable, but just. Seven. His toes curl up under inside his boots. Eight. There are more bodies than yesterday. Nine. And a few left over from the day before. Ten. The squads are getting sloppy or overworked. Eleven. He gets to the palace. Twelve. The same woman and little girl are begging on the corner. Thirteen. The woman is dead. Fourteen. The girl holds a cup, stares straight ahead. Fifteen. A sign in her language is taped to her t-shirt. Sixteen. It reads, Blessed Mother, protect my precious one. Seventeen. He drops some sweat-crumpled bills into the cup. Eighteen. About twenty-five and a half cents U.S. Nineteen. The girl doesn't say thank you in her language, not even automatically. Twenty. This is unusual, he thinks. Twenty-one. He thinks she'll probably be dead by nightfall. 22. At the cafe, his favorite waitress tells him a nephew died last evening. 23. That's four people in her family this month. 24. He expresses his sorrow and orders a rum. 25. He orders a rum. 26. There's an attractive university student reading Franz Fanon at the next table. 27. There were listless parrots in huge cages. 28. There's the busboy he always overtips. 29. He orders a rum. 30. He orders a rum, this one with a bottle of Coke. But the cap's still on, please, and he adds needlessly. Of course, without ice. 31. He strains to see the headlines in a cute student's newspaper. 32. Death toll, as always, in the upper right corner. And assurances that scientific help is coming from the outside. A message from the First Lady. Something about the World Football Cup. 33 and a factory nearby that manufactures binary chemical weapons has been taken over by 34. But the attractive student's nose has begun to bleed. 35, badly. 36, the people are running down the street past the Palace Hotel, ripping up shrubbery, throwing paving stones. 37, it's a lot like TV. 38, the waiter gives the attractive student a kitchen rag and tilts his head back. 39. More people are running and screaming in the streets. 40. The parrots wake up to beat their wings against the bars of their cages. 41. He hears what could be firecrackers or gunshots or mortar fire, and he thinks he really should learn the difference. 42. He thinks out loud. What I do, should do is get my black ass back to New York and fast. 43. Paving stones are being thrown at the cafe. Tables overturned. 44. The busboy says, follow me, you'll be safe. And leads him into the walk-in box. 45. All he can hear is the sound of the motor. All he can feel is cool air. All he can smell is fresh, clean blood. 46, the busboy says in his language, 
we'll be safe here. 47. The busboy sticks his tongue in Matt's mouth. 48. Matt thinks of Elizabeth's letter, latest letter, asking why he doesn't come home and take that teaching job. 49. The busboy unbuttons Matt's pants, pulls them down, spins them around. 180. 50. He thinks of his father teaching him to ride a two-wheeler. 51. He supports himself holding on to the cold, slimy carcasses of two calves, hanging from meat hooks, skinny as dogs. 52. He hears the busboy's pants unzip behind him, and he thinks of paintings by Francis Bacon. 53. The busboy slaps his ass. 54. He hears a loud explosion out beyond the heavy metal door in the pool. More screams, more breaking glass, more parrot squawks and firecrackers. 55. Your legs are very beautiful, but what are those marks? Asked the busboy in his language. 56. It's the end, Matt answers. 57. No, it's not the end. 58. His fingers dig into the fattened muscle of the two hanging calves. 59. The busboy orders, relax. 60. It's not the end. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of the end of everything. Thank you.